Moving on next to number eight, the offerings. And again, following these categories, it begins with the essence of the offerings and use, defines the Sanskrit term puja as to generate before, to repeatedly generate joy, or to revere. And down on the fourth line, offerings are actions that please by means of the various inner and outer offerings that are presented with an intention to physically, verbally, and mentally worship and revere the recipient of the offerings. So we might do a fire or smoke puja, and those are offerings that are being given out. And so here, our intention to, to benefit beings is what is important as a part of that. The various divisions, he has two general categories. First, the unique specific divisions. Worldly or transcendent, uh, actual or imagined, any of these kinds of things can be included in this. On the second page, on the fourth line, he talks about or fifth line, he talks about there are also outer offerings, pleasing gifts and so forth. There are inner offerings, various substances, support substances. He talks then about secret offerings to offer the five poisons as the five wisdoms, for example. Offerings of appearance and existence as great bliss is made by undertaking activities such as union and liberation. And then by means of the view, the great purity and equality, the meditation of appearance and existence as the ground and the conduct of self-liberating whatever arises. So a variety of things that can be encompassed within this and beyond the physical material things, but that can be imagined and so forth as a part of this. All these also can be condensed into four categories, the outer offering of enjoyment, the inner offering of sacred substances, the secret offering of union and liberation, and the suchness offering of great equality. And then he goes through each of these and explains each of them in a little bit more detail. Uh, and in terms of these uh, general categories that we've been referring to as well. Uh, so those four offerings are connected with the four empowerments as a part of this. Going on to page 126. He gives the second category then are the common gathering circles. So this would usually refer to the Gana Chakra. And here he talks about the common, the purpose, and the way to perform it. So the common contains all the offerings that are taught with the outer, inner, secret, and suchness offerings. So all of the different forms of offerings are included in the common category. In the next paragraph, third line, gathering, of fortunate individuals, a gathering of precious materials, and offering this to a gathering of deities, and then perfecting the gatherings of merit and wisdom. So all of these things are forms of gatherings, if you will, in the process. And then he gives a little bit longer, that's the brief explanation, he gives a little longer explanation, talks first about some preliminary activities, uh, collecting together the flowers, piles of flowers, uh, blessing the mandala, uh, gathering the offerings. At the very least, there should be meat and alcohol, that's traditional in all of the tantric gatherings. Now, sometimes those are done in a symbolic manner, we might, for example, have have either tea or wine with some dutsi pills in it. And those are, are fairly common, but uh, the more literal approach would be actual meat and alcohol. And representing method and wisdom, those uh, the meat and the alcohol. The male and female practitioners who possess samayas gather in equal numbers, uh, at least two minimum of two practitioners. Uh, then uh, you can have many more than that, and any group practice is said to multiply the effect of the benefits of that practice, so the more there are, the better in that sense. But if it's mostly men present, 
It is merely called a celebration of heroes, and if mostly women present, it's a banquet of heroines. So it still can be done, even though you don't have uh, equal numbers of male and female practitioners. Next, at the bottom of the page, talks about wearing the dress of the peaceful and wrathful deity on which the flower fell. So if you recall, in the process, we tossed the flower and then the family that that fell on would be with the reference here. And so whatever the deity is, then you would dress up in, in that manner. There should be people placed at the four gates dressed like wrathful deities who will then ask them uh, if they are welcome in a symbolic manner by raising one finger. And then they reply that they are by raising two and then they can enter. Then once inside the act the activity vajra or chopan will ask them what Buddha family they belong to by showing a gesture of the three pronged vajra which is the holding up like this so it's kind of like the top and the bottom parts of a vajra there okay and um, then the practitioners will show the gesture of the main deity of the Buddha family in which the flower fell, so that would be the hand mudra of that particular family. And then the practitioners then make prostrations to the Vajra master and take their seats in rows. They are seated, seated from the rows are um, from left, right, and in front of the leader. Symbolic implements and other items are placed at the rows illustrating the five families. So there's something there to indicate where to go to sit according to the family that you are associated with. And then, uh, let's see, the activity Vajra prostrates and supplications are made to remain in the mandala of meditative stabilization. The main part then begins by offering the torma to the obstructing forces and closing the boundaries. Offerings for the feast are cleansed, purified, multiplied, transformed, and offered to the deities, which are indivisible from oneself. The activity vajra then makes prostrations, distributed, distributes substances using the lotus gesture. And if you recall, the lotus gesture is the hands like this. And sometimes it's, there's, there's different ways of doing it, but uh, that's the basic lotus gesture, like a flower opening up. And this uh, satiates all the deities. They take the offering and, and they are uh, filled with, with all of their needs. And then during the feast offering, we abandon fixation on ordinary appearances and rest continuously in the play of deity, mantra, and meditative absorption. We refrain from any kind of prank, chatter, or mockery, and enjoy the feast substances within equality free from any concepts of pure and impure. Vajra songs, Vajra dances, the union of empty bliss and other offerings may be made at this point. In short, the feast encompasses the entire range of outer, inner, secret, and suchness offerings. Then for the concluding activities, all leftovers, or sometimes called the remainders, are carried out and offered as a torma. And then finally, Vajra songs, dances, and other concluding activities should be performed. Now the ones that I've been in, they've done this in a formal manner, didn't really have any dancing or anything like that, but it was mostly just recitation of various verses that were part of the sadhana practice. Then we go on to the principle involved here on page 128 at the top second line. So these offerings are given to Buddhahood itself. Okay couple more lines down, the entirety of existence and peace is satiated in equality even if one makes offerings to just one deity. All deities are the same. Enjoying an object while one's body, speech, and mind are in the form of the three vajras is identical to making offerings to the Buddha as such. For this reason, it is superior. Buddhas do not entertain concepts of being pleased or displeased. 
Okay? So these are really more for our benefit, our generosity of making these offerings. The next paragraph talks about intention. Enjoyment without fixated grasping takes place within the state of great purity and equality of suchness. And then the last line in that paragraph, the single taste of great bliss and emptiness. Then we go through the ten perfections as it relates to these. So the second line of the next paragraph, this constitutes the effortless, spontaneous accomplishment of the perfection of generosity. To remain unsurpassed and untainted, this involves discipline as well. It also encompasses patience insofar as one is undisturbed. It is diligence in that activities become the accumulations. Meditative concentration is included because one does not stray from the state of equality. It is also knowledge because the nature is realized as it is. Method is the benefit of self and others effortlessly performed. Aspiration is realms and experiences utterly pure. Strength is never subdued by any opposing forces. And finally, wisdom is genuinely, genuinely realizes the nature whereby all dualistic phenomena disappear into non-duality. Moreover, the approach of remaining non-dual with Buddhahood itself, one spontaneously accomplishes activity for the benefit and happiness of all beings in all times and places. In the next paragraph, all suffering, all offering substances are transformed into the nectar of wisdom. And a couple more lines down through visualization, mantras and gestures such that one can present Samatabhadra's cloud bank of offerings in the space of just a single atom, offering infinite riches that fill the reaches of space, an inexhaustible treasure of great bliss. And oftentimes we use that expression, Samatabhadra's clouds of great offerings, you know, so it fills all of space, the entire universe. Okay. So the purpose then, the fourth category, this method of delighting the deities enables one to effortlessly gain all the spiritual attainments of action and wisdom. Offerings are the gateway to fully perfecting the accumulations of merit and wisdom. Continuing on the next page, the top in the second paragraph, in the nature of reality, great purity and equality, there is no fixation on something that is offered, one who offers, and the act of offering. The perfection of all offerings should be understood to take place within the nature of great perfection. So this is known as the perfection of all offerings. So that concludes number eight, dealing with the offerings. The next category, number nine, is enlightened activity. So enlightened activity is the extraordinary skillful actions expressed by bodhisattvas for the sake of others through the four measurable aspirations. Supreme and common uh, activities, the former, generate the seed of liberation in other minds, and the latter manifest provisional blissful results. Also among the ancillary supports are the outer activities that relate to the external sacraments and inner activities of body, speech, and mind. Some activities are said to benefit sentient beings, while others eradicate obstacles, notably the four rights of pacification, enrichment, subjugation, and wrath that we've talked about previously. There are common self-centered activities and supreme altruistic activities attained through the perfection stage, the generation stage, or recitation of mantras. So going to the text now, we're on page 130. So the essence basically is suchness. At the bottom of the page, 
The Sanskrit word karma means physical, verbal, and mental actions. The activities of skillful methods that focus primarily on working for the welfare of others. These are imbued with the relative awakened mind, elicited by the four immeasurables and great knowledge. So then he goes into the divisions of this. There's a number of ways that these can be divided, as in many of the cases that we've seen in this book. But in the second line, supreme enlightened activity involves planting the seed of liberation in another's being by initiating him or her into the mandala using mantras, mudras, or other such means. Common enlightened activities include everything that brings about a pleasant, albeit temporary, result. Then continuing in the next paragraph in terms of support, and he gives some long lists here, Enlightened activities may utilize either external substances or internal body, speech, and mind. Substances include drawings of magical circles, fire offerings, stupas, statues, symbolic implements, corpses, the five meats. Activities can also be accomplished using physical mudras, dances, expressions, gazes, postures, and such. Reciting mantras, singing, uttering words of truth, and mentally through intention and absorption. Moreover, activities can be carried out individually or with one another, as in a group. Next paragraph, in terms of essence, there are four types, pacifying, enriching, magnetizing, and subjugating. So he uh, illuminates each of these a little bit. Pacifying includes pacifying illness, malevolent forces, negativity, obstructions, enemies, fears, obstacles, black magic, and so forth. Enriching activities cause lifespan, merit, wisdom, splendor, retinue, wealth, strength, prosperity, happiness, dharma, and other such factors to flourish. Magnetizing activities bring something or someone under one's control. This may include humans and non-humans, uh, realization and enlightened qualities, material goods, and so forth. Uh, subjugating activity includes summoning, separating, binding, suppressing, averting, killing, expelling, as well as terrorizing and creating bad omens, lightning, hail, and so forth. So lots of different things. This is actually one of the better lists that I've seen of the kinds of things in each of those four categories. Um, a lot of times they're expressed in such general terms uh, that you don't really get a sense of what each of those is all about. So I, I find this per th list particularly helpful there. But also, as you look at some of the things contained in these lists, be careful. There are consequences for doing some of these things. So you do need to be careful about uh, some of those activities, like creating bad omens and hail and lightning and so forth. Uh, in terms of qualities, any act may be ordinary or supreme. So in terms of ordinary, we're talking about acts motivated by the three poisons. Such acts are not embraced with purposeful activity of skillful methods, nor do they lead to a meaningful result, either temporary or ultimate. So such acts are to be avoided. In terms of supreme activities, these are directed towards the welfare of others and are motivated by great compassion. They are characterized by the intent and conduct embraced by extraordinary methods and knowledge. The results are deeply meaningful on both temporal and ultimate levels. Knowledge holders who swiftly accomplish Buddhahood for the welfare of all sentient beings may liberate the enemies and obstructive forces that create obstacles on their path. They may also accomplish activities to pacify their own illnesses and so forth, thereby directly benefiting themselves and indirectly benefiting others. So we can do things when we're at a level of accomplishment to benefit our others so that we can help others. You know, That's an important part of the thing. You can't take care of others if you don't take care of yourself kind of a thing. Then in the next paragraph, other acts 
such as reversing mantras directed at personal enemies of the three jewels may seem to benefit others in a temporary case these are in line with ordinary acts hence they should be avoided knowledge involves knowing the right time knowing how to carry out the act and being skilled when it comes to transforming the result of the activity into the path of enlightenment and we've talked a number of times about how ordinary things can be brought into the path but again we have to be knowledgeable about how to do that method is the supreme strength care needed to carry out the activity mantra mudra or otherwise as well as embracing the act of the profound viewpoint of the conduct of mantra and enlightenment is the ultimate fruition of all of this last paragraph from this page the activities of the buddhas also benefit and create happiness for sentient beings both temporarily and ultimately engaging in buddha activity means to carry out such activities here and now. Then down a few more lines on, on page 133 here. Here, wrathful liberation can be used to directly cut through the stream of negative karma. Similarly, one is able to use the methods of mantra to manifest pacifying and other forms of activity. This is the enlightened activity of secret mantra. So just reciting mantras in and of itself is one of the ways that we can help benefit other beings. And then skipping the quote there, the next line, the aspiration prayers made by bodhisattvas are infinite to bring about temporal and ultimate well-being of all sentient beings. The bottom of the page, the principle here is divided into three categories of the superior approach, middling, and ordinary approaches. The superior approach, then, is accomplished by utilizing the completion stage. Those with the very highest capacity are capable of assessing the nature of the great perfection without signs. And then down four lines, with this ability, they need not work to achieve the desired aims. Instead, they accomplish their aims by merely wishing to do so even if they have yet to attain the degree of mastery their acts will become supreme by imbuing them imbuing all actions with this view so as long as we're able to sustain the view of Dzogchen or Ma Mudra then we are able to do this even though we may not have reached full mastery of these practices and then by familiarizing themselves with the completion stage with signs, diligent individuals may gain the energetic mind by emerging the energies and form. Once this has come to pass, they focus on uh, what they focus on will actually appear once they merely direct their attention to a remedial deity or another such factor. So these would be the comp regular completion stage practices of Tantra. In the middling approach, in the next paragraph, activities are accomplished by utilizing the development stage. Once the coarse and subtle clear appearances have reached the point of perfection, one will be able to support, use supportive activities like mantras and mudras to attain the entire range of worldly spiritual attainments all the way up to those of unexcelled realms. In this manner, one can carry out various activities simply through visualization. So we can visualize ourselves as deities, we can visualize all sentient beings as deities. Then the ordinary approach, the third category in the next paragraph. Activities are accomplished through mantra recitation. Individuals who have received empowerment and not let their samayas degenerate use a ritual and recite secret mantras through the medium of faith. And then down about five, six lines. Without such rituals, activities will not be accomplished because the requisite causes and conditions will not be complete. So we need to engage, have the empowerment and engage in those activities in order to be able to use these in this way. Even if they are not accomplished, their effects will be uh, greatly delayed. 
And then on the next page, 135, following the three quotes at the top, second line of that next paragraph, yet even if one's visualization is nothing more than merely devoted training, mantra will still be accomplished if one has faith. Okay. And then go drop down below the quote into the middle of the next paragraph. Being free of doubt, such as the conviction of knowing the deity and mantra to be inseparable. So that's part of the faith part there. And last paragraph on that page, even if one lacks this understanding, accomplishment is also possible if one faithfully recites one-pointedly and without hesitation, thinking to oneself, this is how it is in the scriptures. Okay? So mantras are a powerful tool. They can be used at many different levels of accomplishment. But even if we just have simple faith, or we understand that to be the way that it is, then we can use those mantras. And so that's a simple way for lay practitioners to go about their day and still make offerings and doing things to benefit others by reciting mantras throughout the day. And so in Tibet and Nepal and India and many of these other places, people will go about reciting mantras continuously throughout the day as they go about doing the other activities that they engage in. At the top of 136 below the quote, on the other hand, spiritual attainment will not manifest for those who have lost faith. And then at the bottom of the page, therefore, faith is extremely important when it comes to mantra recitation. If mantra is accomplished, one will attain the body of a knowledge holder of the desire or form realm and become immortal. One will attain words of truth. Realization will arise in the mind and gradually one's fortune will be equal to that of the superior deity. So again, mantra is a very powerful tool that we can use daily. On 137, below the two long quotes there, so a little below the middle of the page, the better the causes and conditions of the mantra ritual are, such as having a stable visualization and so forth, the swifter and more powerful the accomplishment of mantra will be. So the other things are also of benefit. You do the, the practices and so forth, then that will strengthen the effect of the mantra. So even simple mantra with faith is, is satisfactory. It is able to accomplish things. But having done it through the practice and so forth, it becomes even more powerful. So the purpose at the very bottom of the page, based on the skillful methods of mantra, all desired objectives become accomplished in accord with one's wishes. In this way, the path is swiftly and easily perfected. And then below the next uh, the brief uh, quote, to summarize, and then skip a couple lines, enlightened activity must be accomplished by embracing whatever sadhana one is using with the view, meditation, and conduct and not being without accomplishment, offering mantra and mudra. So to really strengthen those, you have to embody all of those characteristics as a part of the practice. And then skipping down about three lines, ultimately, when one dwells effortlessly in the basic space of the great perfection of natural equality without focusing on an action, agent, or object, enlightened activity will be effortlessly and spontaneously perfected. So the Dzogchen point of view is the strongest of all of these approaches. So the next section is uh, sealing and here dealing primarily with the various mudras involved. So sealing is securing the body speech of the Buddha body speech, mind and activities. And these are classified according to the seals of the ground, path and result. In the case of the generation stage, seals of the path comprise the great seal of the Buddha body, the teaching seal of Buddha speech, and the commitment seal of Buddha mind, as well as the action seal of Buddha activity. 
In the perfection stage, we have the same four, but they are secured by engaging with the female consort, by cultivating the path of Buddhahood, or the four resultant pristine cognitions, which I assume mean the four wisdoms. Um, I couldn't find any reference anywhere in the, the uh, Mipam Rinpoche text that used that term, and the only thing that in about that place was a reference to the four wisdoms. Um, so that seems to be what that relates to, but I'm not exactly sure. And then sealing is symbolically represented by diverse hand gestures. Okay, so going to the text, we're at the bottom of page 138, and here then uh, doing, was actually starting on 139 then, seal derives from the Sanskrit term mudra, which means either to implant or symbolize or a seal that is difficult to transgress. This refers to an extraordinary means that symbolizes the enlightened body, speech, mind, and activities of great beings. With such a symbol, it becomes an embodiment of it and is difficult to transgress. Uh, there's also a sense of a seal as being the kind of thing where a, a royalty of some sort would take some hot wax and a, a seal and stamp something uh, in that sense. So there's that element to what it is that we're addressing here. Kind of seals the thing. Or at the end of the text, where you see things like samaya, 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 or gya, 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 which are sealed, sealed, sealed uh, as a part of that. So here, it has three different divisions, a general presentation, specific, and special presentation. So in the general presentation, it talks about this in terms of ground, path, and fruition. So seals of the ground, the primordial purity of the nature of mind. So these are sight, sounds, and awareness dwell as the nature of the deity, mantra, and dharma body. So this is basically pure view. The temporary seal of the path is used to refine one's experience and nature. So one establishes the body, speech, and mind to be the play of the three secrets. And this is done within the state of Vajra wisdom, the reality of mind the great seal of co-emergent great bliss. And then we have the fruition, which occurs when one has discovered all aspects of the body of self-occurring wisdom. One acts with inconceivable enlightened body, speech, mind, and activities for the welfare of all infinite sentient beings that fill the entirety of space. Then the specific presentation is linked with development and completion stages. So in the development stage, there is the great seal of enlightened form, the Dharma seal of enlightened speech, Samaya seal of enlightened mind, and action seal of enlightened activity. In terms of the completion stage, this is explained in terms of the support for of the spiritual consort the path where the seals manifest, and the fruition of the four wisdoms. So this was the reference I was making to a bit ago. First we have the spiritual consort. Here the Dharma seal is emptiness, the nature of all phenomena. This feminine perfection of knowledge is the true spiritual partner. The actual action seal refers to everyone that appears in female form with long hair, breasts, and so forth. So sorry about that if you have short hair. <laughs> the Samaya seal is the mudra of wisdom, the goddess emanated from one's own mind. And the great seal is the empty form of the energetic mind, the nature of which manifests as the goddess. Sealing with these mudras brings about the attainment of unchanging bliss. So wisdom is indeed the form of the feminine, if you will, and so that is incorporated throughout here. Second, we have the path. Here the action seal serves the support for the attainment of great bliss, symbolic wisdom. This includes the union with a spiritual consort, 
Through such acts, one comes to experience a mere approximation of the great bliss of the basic space of phenomena. This experience is the Dharma seal. The great seal is to be free of all conceptual thought and to, direct, and to directly experience the innate. That would be your own Buddha nature. That which appears out of this state as the mandala of enlightened body, speech, and mind in the ensuing attainment is the samaya seal. This can also be applied to the four joys. So again, he's using various lists of how these things can be uh, applied or compared. So the four joys, the joy, supreme joy, innate joy, and, and joyless joy in this case. In the Tantras, joyless joy is presented as the third stage, but here the state refers to joylessness that occurs once the pangs of desire have been exhausted. So we transcend the sense of desire about that. There is no contradiction here. Both systems hold that innate refers to the instant of wisdom that transcends any dichotomies of desire and non-desire, bliss and non-bliss. This occurs in the interval between complete and total culmination of joy, which is brought about by bodhicitta descending to the tip of the jewel vajra and the initial onset of desirelessness. So this appears to be where he's referring to is where we have the descent and then the reversal of that, at which time that the sense of desire tends to uh, go away, so without any ejaculation. The third one is the fruition of the four wisdoms. Here the Vajra body of appearance and emptiness is the action seal. Vajra speech of clarity and emptiness is the Dharma seal. The Vajra mind of bliss and emptiness is the Samaya seal. And the Vajra wisdom of awareness and emptiness is the essential indivisible equality of these three, the great seal. So these are those four emptinesses that we talk about in the uh, 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 introduction class, the essence uh, uh, class that we do on Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, so the appearance emptiness, the luminous emptiness, the bliss emptiness, and awareness emptiness are the four. And of course there's a fifth one, which is the uh, compassion emptiness of enlightenment, full enlightenment. So then we have the special presentation, the third one. In this context, it is primarily the hand gestures or mudras that represent the various forms of enlightened body, speech, mind, and activities. The essence of the mudra is the samaya seal. So the acts are the action seal, visualizing is the dharma seal, and one's own presence as the deity is the great seal. The foundation of all mudras are held by joining the two palms together. So this is simple Anjali type posture here, and then various things that we do with the fingers as a part of that. So we're performing the Vajra gesture by interlacing the fingers and joining the palm. So when we bring the fingers together in this way. And so then for the various deities, we would use the fingers or there's the, the crossing over one too, where we cross over the two in, in different places that we studied before. So all of these different hand mudras are a part of this. Uh, the foundation of all mudras that are held with the hands apart is the Vajra fist. Okay, so the thumb in between and the fingers moving over that. And then you'll recall that then we would extend one finger or other to the heart and we went through the different ones depending on the particular part that we were referring to. So those are the, the ones with the hands apart, so separate hands instead of joined together there. 
Various root and subsidiary mudras derived from these root mudras include those of peaceful deities, such as the five Buddha families, as well as those of the wrathful deities. Subsidiary mudras, mudras include those of invitation, bestowal of empowerment, and making offerings. Such mudras should be integrated with the revolving lotus, the dancing lotus, and other such mudras. Once complete, they should be released with a snap of the fingers. Okay? So then we have the principle here of these various mudras. He talks first about the principle related to the seals and then how they are used to do that seal. So first the principle so these can be done in six ways. The first of the, these, the mantras and mudras are differentiated in relation to ripened body or speech. In other words, a physical feature is termed a mudra, whereas a verbal expression is termed a mantra. So ordinary body and speech can be a part of this as well. In the second category, on the next page, 142, these are symbols that represent the enlightened body, speech, and mind conveyed through a gesture of the hand or a name, which would be the mantra part. Third, such symbols possess the ability to bring about the spiritual attainment of activity and wisdom, instances of infallible interdependent origination. Fourth, Man mudras and mantras are considered to be expressions of one's own karma within ordinary body and speech and are also recognized to manifest from the strength of the blessings of the thus gone So the extent to which we receive these various blessings that then enables us to be more effective in using these. So mudras and mantras manifest from the blessings of the thus ganwins while being mixed with one's own karmic perceptions. The fifth position in the next paragraph, then mudra and mantra are likened to a moon's reflection. And reflection in the water, so the real and, and the perceived but not real. Nevertheless, it is nothing more than a moon's manifestation. Similarly, mantras and mudras manifest from the blessings of the thus ones and have the potential to bring about spiritual attainments. When those with Samaya imagine themselves to be the deity itself and practice accordingly, the connection with the actual deity occurs. So this is the kind of thing that I've talked about a number of times with the fake it till you make it. You know, you see yourself literally as being the deity. And at least until you attain it, in which case you no longer have to see yourself that way because you are that way. In a similar manner, the deity itself can be accomplished from these symbols. Okay? And then the sixth one in the next paragraph, mantras and mudras are the manifestation of the ultimate form of the victorious ones, the great wisdom of totality. And these are blessed by the power of the compassion and aspiration. And the bottom of that paragraph, there is no actual difference between mantra and mudra and a deity that has attained the form of wisdom. So the sixth position is the supreme, and he talks here about the ranking of these in order that was given there, but the sixth one is considered to be the supreme over all of the rest of those. So then we have the mudras and how they are used to actually create this seal. There are two. And the first one is the reason for sealing. In the outer mantra, mudras have three aspects. First, the cause. They are emanated images of the utterly pure basic space of phenomena and great wisdom. The essence, they represent gateways to complete liberation. And in terms of result, they have the potential to bring about all activities and spiritual attainments. Hence, mudras are signs of great beings. In the next paragraph, when one's being is sealed with a mudra, it will be freed from its bonds. Ignorance will be conquered. The body will be stable and negative forces unable to affect it. 
empowerments will be attained and activities will be accomplished. If one does not lose sight of their nature, the samayas will not degenerate. Since mudras also possess the symbol of the feminine, they are hidden they are a hidden form of female deities. If they are shown to someone, they will be delighted by the very essence of Samaya. And mudras are used to seal for these and other reasons. Continuing in the next paragraph, mudras also fulfill these same purposes in inner mantra. Nevertheless, according to this system, they are primarily used to seal for the following reasons. Within the state of great wisdom, emanated mudras are applied to arouse the awakened mind of great bliss, the indivisible nature of all bliss gone ones and sentient beings. They, are also, they also bring about the effortless attainment of extraordinary mastery and carry out various enlightened Buddha activities for the benefit of other beings. The second part of this section is for the way to actually seal according to outer mantra when the reality of one's being is sealed with the mudra that symbolizes the deity one will actually become the deity through the power of blessings. In the next paragraph the inner mantra the mudra is essentially the deity. As the mudra seals the indivisibility of oneself and the deity, the deity dissolves into the deity. Reality merges with reality, and wisdom revels in wisdom. Through this, one becomes the deity, and the deity, in essence, become oneself. There is no difference between the two, so it's easy to understand that. So then, finally, for the purpose, utilizing these unique methods allows one to accomplish all temporal and ultimate aims and carry out activities of the Buddhas. Mudras sub subsume all dharmas of the ground, path, and fruition, and is maintained by receiving empowerment and abiding by the samayas. It should be kept completely concealed from others. In the next paragraph, in the ultimate meaning, the phenomena of all movements of body, speech, and mind are perfect and do not have to be transformed, bound, or released. As such, they are effortlessly perfected as the nature of mudra. So in a sense, everything that you do is a mudra. And there are specific symbolic mudras, of course, that it addresses in here. But literally everything you do is a mudra. So when you are acting, the fake it till you make it, if you will, you're doing that, everything that you think, say, and do, you think, say, and do as a Buddha. So all of those manifest and, and in ways that are beneficial to beings in the form of mudras are represented in the form of mudras. So mudras are not just hand symbols that we do. They are all kinds of things that we do. They are symbols. Everything we do is symbolic in some nature. Okay, so that concludes the tenth one related to the mudras.